So um, thank you so much for coming today. And um, I'm going to be speaking. I'll try to speak slowly. Let me know if I should slow down. Um, I'm talking. Um, I, I'm, the paper that I'll present today is a piece of a book that I'm in the process of writing, hopefully nearly done with it, um, that I've been working on for the past six years. Um, my interest in this topic um, stemmed from the fact that, uh, first of all, uh, I think it's very important that we understand the origins of the disciplines in which we work and the way in which particularly the 19th century has shaped the way that we go about uh, our research and some of the assumptions that we bring into our research uh, f uh, based upon things that perhaps really aren't relevant uh, to the period uh, under discussion. And this has to do with a larger conversation about the way in which um, that it's impossible to find uh, sort of uh, to reconstruct events that happened a long time ago because of the extent to which uh, our work is colored by the events in our own time, by the world in which we inhabit. So in a sense, we, we tend to see ourselves in that past. And um, we, I think, automatically uh, sort of uh, are attracted to things that are more familiar, or in some cases, we look for things that are strange or exotic. And so the case study that I'm going to be giving today uh, draws from a very extreme example of that, one that's taken from the history of uh, colonialism in France. And my, you may wonder why somebody who started off as an early medieval historian working on burial practice has gravitated to North Africa, to a topic that's so different from the place in which I began. But essentially, I was attracted to this topic because I noticed that a number of people in France who became a number of scholars who became very, very important very, rather quickly did some of their training in North Africa. And so originally when this project began, what I thought I was going to be working on was essentially a history of institutionalization and professionalization of archaeology that occurred outside of France but influenced the way that archaeology was done within France. But what I discovered in starting the project, that it was something entirely different. And the circumstances that made it different was war. And it was a very, very brutal war and one which implicated antiquities and implicated archaeology in part of the colonial project. And so that's what this project has become. Um, and I think that it has great relevance. And this is one of the things that attracted me to this project. I'm sure you're all familiar with what ISIS is doing uh, to antiquities in, in uh, Syria and Iraq. And um, I think that the story that I tell about North Africa helps to explain some of the antipathy that exists in parts of the forder, former Ottoman Empire towards Roman antiquities, that part of it is a product of European colonialism in parts of the former Ottoman world. I'm not saying that this excuses ISIS's behavior, but perhaps it adds a perspective that helps us to understand uh, what's happening in these places. And it's a, it's a history, although I focus on France, I think it's a history that could equally be told in Italy if we think about the Italian colonial project in Libya. And I'm not an expert on Libya. Um, I, I, I defer to my, my colleagues like uh, Stefan Altekamp in Berlin on this topic. But it's important because it, it helps to explain because some of the ideas that are derived from the North African experience are integrated back into archaeology within the metropolitan state. In, in the case I'm looking at in France, particularly under the period of Napoleon III in the 1860s, um, but uh, perhaps that's also true in the case of Italy. So I've divided my paper into three parts. The first part of the paper will look at the war itself to give you some background because I'm not anticipating that many of you are familiar with what the French were doing in Algeria in the 1830s. The next part, um, we'll talk a bit about the treatment of antiquities in North Africa by the French. And finally, I'll conclude uh, with a um, discussion of a particular site uh, of importance to give you a, a case study. So in June of 1827, 
Two months after um, the, um, the, the day of Algiers, the Ottoman day of Algiers, insulted the French consul, a man named Pierre de Val, and this, uh, this, this event in France is known as the fly whisk affair. And you can see in the image here that, um, that the, the day is slapping the face of the French consul with a fly whisk. Uh, and this was considered uh, an egregious treatment of the French consul. So the French had borrowed, or not borrowed, they had purchased wheat from, uh, uh, from uh, Algiers in, during the French Revolution to supply the French army with wheat, but they had never paid for it. And the day was asking the French consul simply to render the funds that were required any of you who are familiar with French history know that by the 1820s, this was a different government than the one that had existed during the time of the French Revolution. It was a Bourbon uh, regime, and they felt that they didn't have an obligation to pay back the debts that were incurred during the French Revolution. As a result of this event, the French instituted a blockade, a naval blockade of the city of Algiers on the coast of North Africa. But this had severe implications for the French economy because it, it, uh, it prevented uh, um, trade from issuing from the south of France. And so Charles X, who saw the writing on the wall, he was the Bourbon King of France, he realized that, uh, that if he didn't do something, he was going to be kicked out of power. So instead, what he did was launch an invasion of the city of Algiers in July of 1830. Now, the, 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 the invasion was very successful the, the, with 37,000 French troops on the coast of North Africa. Uh, they succeeded in defeating the Ottoman Bey. But at the same time, six weeks later, despite the success, Charles X was pushed out of power. And this began the regime known as the July, uh, the period known as the July Revolution, and the regime of Louis Philippe. So this is um, some contemporary images um, of the the attack. Now Louis Philippe, when he came to power, was largely known for having a pacifist foreign colony, but he inherited this poorly strategized regime uh, uh, change in North Africa. In other words, the French, at the time of their invasion, didn't really know what they were doing in North Africa. They weren't sure whether they were going to stay or whether uh, they would leave. But within about a decade, the, um, the invasion force of 37,000 was multiplied by four times and reached uh, 120,000 by the mid-1840s. And the July monarchy tacitly supported what the French army, which essentially acquired a significant amount of autonomy in North Africa, was doing. In 1837, they expanded the territory under their control to the neighboring uh, 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 Ottoman regime that was based at the city of Constantine. And uh, it became clear after the 1830s that uh, that this, uh, this was not a temporary thing, that the French were really in North Africa to stay. And it's important to keep in mind, in terms of the invasion force, that many of the officers who participated in this event were graduates of uh, a, a training school in France known as the Ecole Polytechnique. Um, they believed, based upon the ideas of a, philosopher, a social philosopher named um, uh, um, Saint Simonia, that they were, uh, or Saint Simon, that they were going to uh, bring modernization to North Africa. So this was part of the the rhetoric of the war was that it wasn't only for the gain of France, but it was also because they were going to bring quote civilization to North Africa. They were also going to bring modernization. They would bring scientific and technological advances that weren't present in North Africa at the same time. Now, at the time of the original surrender agreement in July of 1830, uh, the French general, a man named Bourmont, assured that the French would respect the Islamic religion and the property rights of indigenous inhabitants. But 
troops almost immediately violated these provisions. From the earliest days of what the French referred to as the pacification of North Africa, um, the, the, um, the, the French army, known as the Armée d'Afrique, appropriated people's homes, they turned mosques into churches, they took agricultural land, and in a number of instances, they also massacred civilians uh, of the uh, indigenous population, both Arab as well as Berber. In time, the European settlement grew rapidly. By 1840, there were 27,000 European civilians in North Africa. And I say European because it was actually a significant mix. It wasn't just French colonists. There were people from Malta, from Spain, from Sicily, from Sardinia, from all over the Mediterranean. People migrated, especially Europeans, because their status was automatically higher than that of the indigenous people of North Africa. So by 1850, there were 125,000 Europeans living in North Africa, whereas before this period, it was probably a few hundred. This is a map of uh, French Algeria from the 1840s. The line that goes down the center on the right-hand side, that separates it from Tunisia. That was a separate, uh, that remained under Ottoman control until, the, until 1881. Some of the main places I'll be talking about, I've circled. Um, I'm sorry that the, it's, the writing is very small, um, but uh, uh, let's see, a little bit further to the south, you can see um, Constantine. Algiers is further um, to the west. Now, along with the normalization of uh, violence against the civilian inhabitants and the systematic confiscation of territory in this regime, the French, very importantly, also made claim to the patrimonial heritage of North Africa. And what I mean by the patrimonial heritage is, the, in, in fact, in large part, the Roman remains of, of, uh, of Algeria. And this is quite different, I think, than, say, when Napoleon invaded Egypt uh, during, uh, in, in 1799, because there he came with, equipped with a team of people who would study Egyptian archaeology. In the case of the French, they didn't, I don't think they were really anticipating finding a lot of Roman remains. And because Algeria didn't have a Middle Ages, like, say, in Europe, um, many of these structures were still intact because they hadn't been used, for instance, to build cathedrals or Christian buildings or, or medieval buildings after this period. The stone was, many of these places were no longer heavily inhabited, and so the, the, the remains were, were impressive uh, in, in uh, French estimation. We know from early in the conquest period that these officers, especially those from the Ecole Polytechnique, and I should mention, the officers who went through this training were very familiar with Roman history. Uh, the Ecole Polytechnique had, for instance, a requirement that all officer trainees learn Latin and be able to read it. They also learned how to draw. They learned how to make maps, because that was very important to the military. And, um, and they learned about ancient Roman battles. And the very strange thing about the period of the invasion is that when they got to North Africa, they didn't really have any modern maps. And in fact, they were relying on ancient and medieval maps of the region for their sort of understanding of where, like the Antonine itinerary, which is a list of how long it takes to get from place to place. In the 19th century, the French officers were still using that as their main point of reference for this military venture. And so one of the first things that they have to do is they have to start mapping the territory by modern standards so that they could understand where things were located relative to one another and how long it would take to get from place to place and also what the resources were. Because up till that time, they're reading things like Livy. They're reading the ancient historians to say, you, uh, North Africa was the breadbasket. So we're going to find equivalent amounts of fertile soil. We're going to be able to use this as a, um, an agricultural center and that will back our own regime. 
And so we know uh, from uh, contemporary reports, and I, I won't go into detail, but these officers, when they arrive in these locations, describe the fact that there are Roman remains to be found everywhere. He says there are bricks, tiles, pottery shards, remnants of mosaics, and um, he says that, uh, and this is a quote from 1832 from a man named uh, Claude Antoine Rosé, who was a captain in the Royal Corps of the Army's general staff. He says that he sees these antiquities everywhere, and the last phrase is particularly important. He says, we soon proceeded to visit these places with all the avidity and interest that the appearance of ruins, especially those that recalled the passage of the ancient masters of the world, inspired in sensitive hearts. And what he means by this is that, that in essence, uh, he identifies with the Roman past, and he sees in these remains something that's very important. Now, I should point out that that the Roman remains that were discovered in these locations weren't just inspirational, but they were also practical. The, Roman, the French army, like the Roman army before it, needed water. So one of the very first things that they looked for is where the Romans had aqueducts and where they still functioned, as well as passing legislation to defend the aqueducts from being destroyed because they knew that they needed a steady water supply. They were interested in where the Roman cisterns were located, and they also looked for Roman fortifications because these were reused by the French as fortifications uh, themselves. So legislation, such as the piece I've put up here, um, were, were issued by the French army that no one was to tamper with the aqueducts because the aqueducts were still necessary uh, for uh, the, French, uh, fr the French infrastructure for the French army. They also looked to Roman remains as a blueprint for their own activities. So for instance, they uh, suggested that, for instance, if the Romans built forts in certain places, if they built roads in certain places, this is where the French army should do the same because it allowed them to know, they, they trusted the Romans in a lot of ways and they thought if the Romans were smart enough to do it this way, then maybe we should do it this way as well. Now they always said, we're not just copying the Romans, we're going to bring our own initiative to this process because of course the Romans only ruled North Africa for 300 years and we plan to rule this region for a lot longer. So there was a little bit of a criticism of, of Roman activities but at the same time, especially in the first two decades, Roman imprint is very important in determining how the French will conquer the region. Yet beyond um, the confirmation that they felt uh, in coming to this area, I would suggest that some Roman officers, one of them being Armand Jacques Le Roy de saint Arnaud, who was very uh, important uh, Roman, uh, Roman uh, French general during this period, who later became the Maréchal de, uh, de France, um, he um, also identified very personally uh, with uh, his role and that of the ancient Romans. He said, um, all of the establishments that I founded in the province of Constantine were dictated by the thought of recreating the Roman occupation. This is the same system I am applying in the west uh, of Algeria. This explanation is to help you understand, Monsieur Maréchal, the importance that I ascribe, I'm sorry, no, I'm, I'm quoting the wrong one. Um, so that, that, was, um, that, was, uh, that was Valet, I'm sorry. That was the example of Valet talking about how he made his decisions. But in the case of Arnaud, he identified more personally. He said that when I arrived on the 31st of January and made my triumphal F, uh, en entry into ancient uh, Sirta, which is the Latin name for Constantine, the seat of the ancient kingdom of Juba, Massinissa, Jugurtha, Sifax, my ancient predecessors in the governance of beautiful and rich Numidia. So here he's saying he's part of a long line of invaders of this region. He identifies very specifically, and by referring to Constantine as Sirta, he sort of erased the fact that there were over 1,500 years, well, not 15, at that point it was seven. Uh, 1300 years of Arab rule of the region. There's no mention of that at all. He identifies with the ancient past. 
So this is where uh, historians of archaeology, including um, uh, Margarita Diaz Andrew, whom you'll uh, hear in, in late May, have argued that this has to do with the way in which archaeology is then implicated in this process of colonial domination. So, but I should point out that despite uh, French attachment to this ancient past, this does not mean that the French treated antiquities in the region very well. And this is a, 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 an image taken from probably the late 1850s or so, possibly 1860s. Um, and this shows you what the state was of Roman remains in the region after the French uh, uh, essentially um, had passed through the region. The French used these remains, as I've mentioned, to support their regime. And in many cases, they simply destroyed the remains because the cut stone was materiel for the things that the army required. Okay? So they used them to build military barracks, and uh, they built a, a prison at the, city, at the uh, Roman camp of Lambasis. They used inscriptions to pave roads because the inscriptions were nicely cut and flat. And so this doesn't imply, then, a respect for the archaeological remains of the period. Across the territory, the French co-opted ancient fortifications, cisterns, aqueducts, and also destroyed many, many Roman remains. And we know this also because although the French didn't, the French talked about destruction, but in 1873, a German archaeologist and epigrapher arrives in North Africa and cannot believe the devastation before his eyes. He said that more than half of the inscriptions that had existed when the French were there in the 1850s by the 1870s were gone. So this gives you a sense of the level of destruction far more than we can see um, on the continent. Now, in undertaking this project, I had a number of different qualms. And one of them was to talk about the destruction of antiquities at the same time that thousands upon thousands of people were dying. And this is something I think that reporters are also having difficulty with in reporting on ISIS, is that we're not just talking about remains. I mean, we're also talking about human lives. And so I try to find a balance between these two things and acknowledge, too, the destruction that the French were causing on indigenous communities. One of the most famous or infamous events uh, is known as uh, the, the event known as Les Grottes de Dara, where um, the French uh, officers were responsible for lighting a fire at the opening of a cave where over a thousand civilians had taken refuge, and they, they died of asphyxiation. And this was uh, news that the French, didn't, French army did not want to reach France, but which was leaked and was uh, sort of front page news on French periodicals at the time. Um, the French also used a policy which was known as the Razzia uh, in North Africa. This meant that when tribes rebelled against the French regime, that they would destroy their villages. They would cut down the olive trees, they would take all of their flocks, they would destroy their homes, leaving them to face a uh, winter uh, completely exposed. And so a huge number of Algerians died uh, uh, under those circumstances. They weren't directly killed, uh, but they faced uh, very difficult circumstances as well. It's thought that in the 1860s, the humanitarian uh, uh, Tra uh, tragedy grew so great that roughly uh, somewhere between a third and a half of the native Al population of Algeria uh, died, somewhere between 820,000 and a million victims. It's thought that essentially that the, because of malnourishment and then the spread of epidemics like cholera, that as many people died in North Africa as we think died during the Black Death uh, in uh, late medieval Europe, in the, the mid-14th century. Except that in this case, the scourge of French policies was largely uh, to be blamed. So there's no question that inanimate objects, such as uh, monuments, have to be kept in perspective in light of uh, the barbarity of the French conquest of this period. Um, the, the obliteration of these remains operated in tandem with the French army's lack of respect for human lives and livelihood. So 
at the risk of anachronistic evaluation or evaluation, it's not much to say that the Army's devastation for these sites far outweighed the harm, for instance. We talk a lot in Europe about the, the, the impact of the French Revolution and the number of antiquities that were destroyed during this time. And in France, the story is often told of Alexandre Lenoir, who tried to defend medieval remains from the uh, French revolutionaries and created a museum, which is the antecedent of the Musée de Cluny today. But, um, but on no level can we make a comparison in terms of the level of French destruction in Algeria. And also in France, often when we talk about cities like Paris, we talk about the Industrial Revolution, not just that, but also the transformation of Paris under Napoleon III and the, the making of a modern city that we're familiar today with the, the broad boulevards and the number of medieval remains that were destroyed during this period. And we still can't match the level on which destruction happened in North Africa. And this is in large part because under the conditions of war, you don't have to pay attention to property rights. Um, none of this matters. The French used the territory of North Africa for their own purposes. And in the image you can see here, you see a, a structure at the camp of Lambasis in North Africa known as the Praetorium. Whether that's right or not is another story. But just behind it, you can see the prison that the French built there in 1850 in part using the stones from the archaeological site to erect a prison to house the prisoners of 1848. These were people who had participated in the revolution of 1848, and in 1850 they were sent to North Africa. In 1852 they were sent to Lambasis to help build a prison uh, on the site of this ancient uh, Roman uh, camp. This uncomfortable legacy is typically omitted from the history of archaeology of this period. In most narratives that we receive of this period, um, there is focus on a, a French archaeological expedition led by Bory de saint vincent which was sent to North Africa in 1839 to study the antiquities of this period. Um, and um, this mission, which was a sort of um, a follow-up on Napoleon's uh, mission to, um, uh, to Egypt, was, um, is so, sort of seen as the starting point uh, and the beginning of institutionalization in North Africa. <clears throat> French officers and civilians are remembered primarily as contributing to the collecting of ancient inscriptions uh, uh, and monuments such as the image we see here by um, uh, Captain Delamere. Captain Delamere was a part of this uh, scientific expedition that went to North Africa and played a very important role uh, in the undertaking. But we, ha we cannot um, neglect to mention that the scientific conduct of archaeology in Algeria was an additional tool by which the French authorities cemented their rule of the territory and created what historian Patricia Lorson has called a French colonial space. <clears throat> by laying claim to ruins and to especially to inscriptions, and we have a number of accounts of people saying, look, these inscriptions are in Latin, they're ours, and they're not yours. They don't belong to you as a people of North Africa, of Arab extraction. And so we, we are just taking back territory that belonged to our ancestors, to our predecessors. And the French look to these, um, to these remains. Um, <clears throat> the Duke de Orléans, who was the son of Louis Philippe and one of the officers involved in commanding the French army in North Africa, he wanted to bring back the triumphal arch of Jamila um, to, uh, uh, to France. This never happened because it was much too heavy. And unlike in Egypt, there was no Nile to transport very heavy stone northward. Um, so this remained in Algeria. Uh, but nonetheless, a statue uh, was erected uh, in North Africa commemorating the role um, of the Duc d'Orléans. Um, but, but this is part of a longer tradition of bringing back spoils of war and hosting them in uh, the uh, capital of the conquering uh, uh, country. So by the 1880s, 50 years after the conquest, French historians felt comfortable in explaining the history of North Africa as one of conquests. 
one in which uh, the French were part of a long, <clears throat> excuse me, a long series of conquests, uh, of which uh, they, they looked most importantly back to the Romans, but which they recognized there were a whole host of uh, conquests uh, in between. But they used this essentially as an excuse for uh, justifying their presence in North Africa because they said that the people of North Africa could not rule themselves. They relied on outside rulers, external rulers, and now it was the turn of the French. But as the French authorities gained deeper familiarity with the ancient sites and landscape of Algerian territory, um, there doesn't seem to have been a systematic approach to how they went about doing this work. So uh, in the period that I'm studying, which goes up to the 1870, it's really very unsystematic. It's similar to France in this period too, thank you, that there's no, um, there's no structure that oversees uh, archaeology in this region until uh, well into the 1880s. In the period I'm talking about, it was very haphazard, it was very insufficient to actually protecting any uh, of the monuments of this region. Although there was lip service given by um, uh, leading uh, officers to remains, uh, most famous of whom was probably Thomas uh, Robert uh, Bougeaud, um, he said uh, it was important, but nonetheless he was responsible for destroying uh, these remains. Charles Texier, who I have a quote here, uh, fr uh, was uh, appointed as the first uh, um, administrator who was responsible for monuments in North Africa in 1845. He noted that French domination in bringing civilization to Africa is thus connected above all to the great monuments of Roman domination wherever they can be established, reestablished. And by this he said, we need, to, we need to keep these monuments because they are markers of our own legitimacy. They help us understand why we're here. Another uh, figure who was very important in this process was a man named er uh, Adrien Berbruget, who was the founder of the first uh, European museum and library in North Africa, the Bibliothèque Musée d'Alger, and one of the first archaeological societies in North Africa. And he recognized uh, the importance of these monuments, but he profited from the spoils of war. For instance, many of the early manuscripts that existed in uh, the, the library uh, in Algiers were Qurans that had been confiscated by the French army. He actually accompanied the French army as it passed through various territories and scooped up uh, manuscripts as he found them. And he too recognized that in the early years there had been a lot of destruction in North Africa. But he said that it was justified, that security, this may sound very familiar, this sounds very similar to what the Americans said when they invaded Baghdad. Security is our first issue. Um, there may have been many antiquities that were destroyed during this period, but uh, the ultimate goal was more important. And now that we are firmly established in North Africa, we can take care of these antiquities. Although, of course, for many of them, it was much too late. The minister of war in France was not that interested in antiquities. He said that they were a distraction from the main circumstances for which the French were present. So there's no question that French officers and later civilians approach Roman uh, ruins selectively, and this I should point out as well, it was almost exclusively, so because these were officers who were doing, conducting archaeology in this period, they're mostly interested almost exclusively in Roman remains, and especially Roman remains that have to do with the Roman army. During this period, there's no recognition of Byzantine archaeology. There's very little attention to Christian archaeology almost not a single mention of the Vandals. Um, that, that they're digging right through that stuff if it's present at all. In their records, they only note the presence of inscriptions and large structures, and the kind of archaeology that they're undertaking is not really what we would call excavation today. It's mostly clearing debris away from the sites they're interested in, and copying and drawing the ruins they find, and then collecting a few key pieces that would be brought back to uh, museums in Europe. So, uh, um, essentially, in this period, um, uh, officers wrote about the need to save uh, 
uh, Roman remains, and also the parallel between the Roman period and the French remains. But as I mentioned before, they want to make, they give attention to the fact that they're not just copying what the Romans did. And uh, Azema de Montgravier here wrote that we're not, we're not proposing to imitate them like uh, just rote, by rote, to, to, to copy them, but rather to learn from their examples and what they might bring. Do you want me to take a stop or am I okay? Okay, okay, I thought, okay, no, okay, okay, thank you. So, um, so even if officers who had more scholarly inclinations considered ancient monuments to be central to their vision of the colony's future, the army had already obliterated a large number of remains um, uh, in, in once, uh, a region that was once plentiful uh, with these uh, objects. Now, there were attempts in the 1850s uh, to uh, preserve these remains. We see in the 1850s the creation of archaeological societies in the cities of Algiers and Constantine, as well as the creation of museums, although the one in Algiers actually goes back to the 1830s, but at the beginning it didn't have a lot of archaeological material. Almost exclusively, they're looking to Roman remains. It's not until the 1880s, for instance, that they begin to look at Arab remains. Um, Byzantine remains also is significantly late, 1880s, 1890s. The hope for a more permanent solution to the conservation of antiquities seemed to reside in antiquarian societies on the model of how they existed in Europe, which is how uh, most archaeological research was published and conducted in this period. Um, the uh, Musée Archéologique de Constantine uh, was established, uh, I believe, about 1856. Um, it contained many remains, but the museum faced many challenges, and on a number of occasions, the archaeological remains it collected uh, were, um, especially those that were too large to be put inside of a, the protection of a building, were often confiscated by the, Rome, by the French army and used for military purposes. And this happened in cities, the city of Cherchelle as well, where the mayor of the city of Cherchelle actually sold off 300 inscriptions that had been collected by the museum because the, the French military was building a road and they needed pavement stones uh, for it. They just used the inscriptions for that period. So before uh, the 1870s, the preservation of these remains was extremely haphazard. So I'm going to switch now to a more specific case study to give you an example of how this played out. I'm going to look at a single monument, which is known as the Tombeau de la Chrétienne, uh, among the French, um, and the treatment, excavation, and display of this Roman era ruin, because I think it helps us to explain the importance of contextualizing archaeological undertakings in Algeria against the backdrop of the uh, conquest and uh, settlement of this territory. Now, this mausoleum first became widely known in France when Napoleon III, on his second visit to Algeria in 1865, uh, sort of passed through um, uh, the region from which he could see the site in the distance. He wasn't able to come close because at the time there were no roads that led up to the monument, so he could only see it in the distance. His visit was made during a significant moment of crisis in Algeria because at this time, um, these are, this is the year just before uh, the massive epidemics, the cholera epidemics of 1866 and 1867, and the famines that were a part of this. Napoleon III, as some of you may know, was very, very interested in archaeological remains of the Roman period. Uh, his regime was responsible for purchasing from Italy the Campana collection, and also, he was uh, very interested in uh, Julius Caesar, in particular, because he believed he was the heir of Julius Caesar. And he undertook excavations at Alesia, uh, most famously, because he wanted to sort of note uh, the, uh, one of the most important uh, battles of Juli Julius Caesar uh, against Vercingetorix in, uh, in France. 
So he put a huge amount of funding towards archaeological objectives, very different than the era that preceded him. Um, his, the, his coup happens in December of 1851. His archaeological t undertakings really date more from the early 1860s for the last 10 years of his regime until the time um, of the Franco-Prussian War. Now, Tombeau de la Chrétienne was well, not well known, but was known in, a, in certain circles from at least the uh, uh, 18th century. During travels to the region, some famous uh, 18th century antiquarians, among them Thomas Shaw and James Bruce, uh, one being uh, English, the other Scottish, um, identified uh, this structure and comment, commented on this mausoleum. Um, they identified this pyramid-like structure by reference to a passage that was recorded by the Spanish geographer Pomponius Mela, who described the Mauritanian royal mausoleum as being located at roughly this place. In the 19th century, French scholars recognized it as the burial place of Juba II, the Numidian king of Mauritania, and his wife, Cleopatra Selena, who was the daughter of Antony and Cleopatra. They were loyal clients to the uh, Roman emperors during Juba's reign, which lasted from 29 uh, BCE to 20 CE. And the monarchs established their capital at Caesarea Julia, which is uh, modern day Cherchelle, which was part of uh, the French um, uh, colony. But their dynasty was not long lived. Their son, uh, King Ptolemy, did not survive uh, his murder by um, Caligula in 40 CE. So this essentially was very briefly a royal mausoleum, uh, which uh, had only sort of, uh, was only used for a period probably of 20 or 30 years. Now, although Bear Bruget, now Bear Bruget, uh, who I mentioned to you already, um, as being the founder of the Musée, uh, the Bibliothèque Musée uh, d'Alger, was very powerful in antiquarian circles, but had no money to excavate. And so during Napoleon III's visit to um, uh, Algeria in 1865, he petitioned him and said, please, we need funding to look at this important Roman site, because he knew that Napoleon III was interested in this. And uh, Napoleon III, who was curious, possibly having seen it from a distance, said, okay, I will give you 10,000 francs to excavate the site, which for this period was a significant amount of money. Now, Bear Bruget had been long interested in the site. We believe that he saw it probably in the late 1830s for the first time, and it's, it's west of the city of Algiers, so it wasn't too far from where he was located, and he, um, and he was interested in it enough to try, he went back on a number of occasions. In the 1850s, he applied for money to excavate the site, um, and he was given only 500 francs. Um, and he was able to excavate uh, for a period of about four weeks. But so you can understand that when he received 10,000 uh, francs for this purpose, that obviously he was very pleased at the outcome. Now, uh, I should talk a little bit about the name Tombeau de la Chrétienne. The French gave it this name because of the um, carved, what appears to be a carved cross on its exterior, which um, I don't think is thought uh, to have that significance. It simply uh, perhaps was a coincidence because of the date of the creation of the mausoleum. This makes absolutely no sense. Or because of a mistranslation of the Arabic name for this, which was the tomb of the Roman woman. At some point, it became converted to tomb of the Christian, uh, tomb of the Christian, uh, of the Christian woman. Actually, Bear Bruges' activity at the site was no doubt also because in the majority of the remains, archaeological remains in uh, Algeria, were in the province of Constantine, and he was based in Algiers, which was sort of monument poor by comparison. And so um, he knew that a similar site, which is thought to have been older at Med Madrasen, had been excavated in the province of Algiers. And so it was also a sort of competition between the two sites. Now, um, that this site was excavated, uh, or at least explored, I should say, more accurately in the 1850s. Um, but the studies were relatively incomplete and inconclusive. So um, in the 1850s, 
Uh, as I mentioned to you already, um, uh, Bert Bruget asked for money to excavate the Tombeau de la Chrétienne. And when I say excavate, I should specify, it mainly meant pulling away the stones that had fallen around the site, and he wanted to go inside it, just like the story of the pyramids. He wanted to find out what, because there were a, a number of ancient legends circulating that it was filled with treasure, and I would argue that he was trying to get in because he was hoping he was gonna find a bunch of gold that would imitate um, sort of what uh, was happening in Egypt in the same period. Uh, he only received 500 uh, francs to undertake this dig, very interestingly, um, on this dig in 1855, he was joined by a man named John Beasley Green, whom I had never heard of before. It turned out he's an American photographer who had previously um, photographed uh, excavations of the pyramids in Egypt and came briefly to Algeria um, to photograph this site, which some people thought looked quite similar uh, to the pyramids. In his digs, in order to save money, uh, the uh, Bert Bruget used uh, the services of uh, the Zouave. These were uh, light infantry soldiers, um, which at this point were largely European, although it had included indigenous troops in their earlier incarnation. Um, but uh, they were mainly used for moving stones that had fallen off the site away from it so it could be seen more clearly. But most of the work that was being done was they were looking for the entry into this um, structure. And you can see this picture here um, taken by uh, uh, Beasley Green in 1855. Um, it's known as the, the, the false door um, because they thought this would be the way in, but it turned out it was not. And um, for the history, those who are interested in the history of photography, this is the earliest dig that I'm aware of in Algeria uh, at which photography was used as a tool for archeology span for helping to document uh, uh, an excavation. Uh, these are uh, calotypes. The calotypes uh, were a type of photography it, it, um, that were not good for moving shots. It was, you had to stay still for a very long time to develop these, but the advantage of the calotype over the daguerreotype was that um, it could produce uh, from a single negative multiple positives, which was not the case with daguerreotypes. Um, but unfortunately, Green died of um, something he contracted in Algeria about six weeks after these photographs were taken. Um, so he died at the age of 28. The photographs went to the Institut de France and they were never published, but they remain an important record of this excavation. Now in 1865, when Napoleon III, after his visit, uh, Bert Bruget got to a second try. He got to go back to the excavation and he brought uh, photographers with him, in this case uh, those who were using daguerreotypes, um, so these are single uh, photographs, but also a very important record um, of the excavations. So in 1865, uh, with uh, the, essentially the funding came in two allotments, 6,000 francs the first time and then close to 6,000 the second, so more like 12,000 francs. Uh, Napoleon III um, uh, uh, sponsored, gave imprimatur to this excavation. The first thing that Bert Bruget Bar did was he um, had them blaze a road to the site because otherwise it was very inaccessible. Um, and the next thing he did was he tried to get into the mausoleum and this is where much of the money went. Um, he, um, he hired, he used the money to hire uh, um, a, uh, a mining engineer um, uh, from Algiers who uh, used artesian tools, which are usually used to find uh, water to, and dig wells, as well as using um, uh, explosive material to blast his way into the mausoleum. Um, they made over, um, uh, I think, 13 or 14 probes into the monument. So this is very different from the way we used to archaeology today because these were very invasive techniques which were causing destruction to the monument as they tried to blast into the side of it uh, with explosives. Um, on, they finally, on their 13th probe, were able to uh, breach uh, the uh, side of the mausoleum and they found uh, an entrance uh, into the monument. With the help of military explosives to breach the structure, they were able to enter the, the monument on the 15th of May. This was after seven months of trying to get into um, the Tombeau de la Chrétienne. 
So the image that I show you here is a map that's drawn uh, roughly at this period of the way that they understood uh, this monument after they cleared out debris from the interior, how it worked. Bear Bruget reported that they first entered into a corridor which led to a doorway um, guarded by a sculpted lion and lioness. And from there, they were able to clear the debris and they proceeded up a brief staircase of seven steps to reach the principal gallery uh, which wound counterclockwise around the base of the circular monument. And this is the image you can see here. He thought that the space was used for ancient Egyptian ceremonial purposes. Um, at the very center of the monument, the hallway passed through a narrower passageway before reaching the main room, which was at the heart of the structure. And that's a small square that you can see in the middle. And this was what they believed housed the ashes belonging to the royal couple who had been in, uh, cremated according to um, a Roman tradition. Um, so uh, he was very disappointed to find that there were no treasures, there was no gold. Um, there were many rumors circulating in this period that he, he would find a lot more than he actually did. In fact, he had a lot of trouble convincing uh, local people to uh, work on this excavation because they were very concerned about going into the structure because a local tradition told them that this uh, was, was dangerous. Bear Bruget attributed the fact that there was no treasure to the fact that the, the mausoleum after the uh, murder of Ptolemy uh, was not guarded and that in late antiquity the tomb was probably robbed. He said maybe it was also a hiding place for criminals and Christians in late antiquity. Um, but by the time of the Arab invasion, he thought that uh, the entrance to the tomb must have been forgotten, that the stones had fallen in front of it, and it's after this date that there, he thought that nobody really had gone inside the block passageway. So he, he recounted, and I won't go into great uh, detail about uh, what, he, what uh, the legends were in the area, um, but uh, there were a number of ones which talked about the uh, fabulous finds on the inside, and there were some uh, very interesting stories, and if anybody's interested in, in hearing about them, about uh, Halula, who was the guardian fairy of the Tombo de la Chrétienne, who was guarding the riches on the interior. We can't help think that Bear Bruget, who included a, a, an account um, of these fantastic tales, had himself sought, just like the, um, the, discover, not the so called dis European discoverers of the pyramids, that he was going to find similar fame and similar riches. Um, he spent nearly 30 years trying to get into the structure, and he used the opportunity to deride native superstition um, and, uh, and sort of uh, uh, dismiss sort of these local traditions as inaccurate. Um, his methods we would, um, uh, of, of using artesian probes and laying explosives to break open the structure were only marginally less destructive than uh, anything anybody else had caused in this period. And when he only found bone fragments and scattered artifacts on the interior of the Tombeau de la Chrétienne, he had even beaten the walls of the structure with a crowbar to determine if there were any hollow um, compartments in which more riches might be found. So in the end, it's interesting, Bear Bruget does not openly admit defeat, but instead he made the best of what the site had to offer to him as its main archaeologist one who was sponsored by the emperor and could at least take credit for having succeeded in breaking his way into the long impenetrable Roman era mausoleum of Juba II and Cleopatra Selena. So what he did was he contacted the most important officials in the Algerian colonial regime just a week after breaking into the Tombeau de la Chrétienne, he invited them to come out to the site uh, on the 22nd of May, 1866. He welcomed the governor general, a man named McMahon, to the site, his wife and his chief of staff, um, and a number of other important officials. He alleged that such a large number of people arrived at the scene to witness the opening of the tomb, both Europeans and indigenous people, that some were perched on the graded stones of the monument itself. After a tour for the VIPs, the most important people, of the interior of the mausoleum, the governor general staff lit flares on the top of the structure as evening came on, and Bear Bruget recounted, 
that the effect was more stunning than it had, one had ever hoped, that fantastic reflections on the monument on the spectators at its base near the entrance of the underground burial place gave the people and objects a gloomy hue as if one were transported back 18th centuries at the moment when a nocturnal convoy brought some monarch of Mauritania to, its final, uh, to his final palace. So his orchestration of these events um, a sort of presage or precipitate uh, a new phenomenon that would be occurring in this region, which is tourism. Uh, Bear Bruget's concern was that the monument, the Tombeau de la Chrétienne, would become in the future a place that people would visit. Um, and he published word of the discovery, uh, both in journals in North Africa as well as in France. One of the first steps he did was to commission by a sculptor uh, two plaster scale models of the Tombeau de la Chrétienne, one of which would stay in Algiers, and one of which went uh, to Paris for the Algerian pavilion of the Exposition Universelle, the, the World's Fair of 1867. So it was clear from the very beginning he meant to circulate word of the discovery of Tombeau de la Chrétienne and to suggest uh, its importance uh, in understanding the patrimony um, of Algeria. And uh, he got a local council to, to, for instance, pay the salary of a guard to stand at the front. So I'll conclude now. However few um, they were in number and effectiveness, there were French advocates for the uh, benefits of fostering conservation uh, of ancient monuments in Algeria. And one of the greatest was Léon Renier, who was a member of the Institut de France and spent more than six months in the 1850s in Algeria to record Latin inscriptions. Um, and these were because, as I mentioned before, that these Roman uh, inscriptions were France's claim uh, to historical claim to their domination of North Africa. And uh, uh, Renier himself also recognized their importance for the future economic growth of the Algerian colony, and that was through tourism. He said that, um, that these will be, uh, uh, first of all, of political importance, but also their preservation will help to make our colonists better uh, uh, devoted to the history of this place, will make them identify with this territory, and also they will have institutions of which they will be proud. And here he's referring to museums and patrimonial sites that tourists would be able to visit in the future. So even if these ancient monuments were officially re ignored, Renier recognized they were important and highly potent symbols of French rule in uh, the region and their claim to the territory. So study of the treatment of monuments and the practice of archaeology in the context of the colonial conquest in and the settlement of Algeria sheds light on the ideological underpinnings of French archaeological exploration in North Africa in the course of the 19th century, and it has many lessons for us today. French officers' personal interest in ancient remains, and in some cases their passionate intercession on behalf of recording, if not preserving, evidence of Roman rule of the region, reveals much about their understanding of the military operations they led or in which they participated or from which they hoped to gain. And, and here, um, this is uh, another quote just to give you an ident identification with this area. This would be the area into which the French would go to restore the glory days of, uh, of North Africa under Roman rule. However, there is no denying that their archaeological activities represented more than just a pleasant way to pass the time when not on campaign. The French were fascinated with the ancient past and also made extraordinary efforts to record, excavate, and preserve some of the fragments of the ancient past. But we cannot forget the fact that it was part of a colonial venture. So I'm going to end my um, lecture today by just pointing to a single image that Bear Bruget himself drew and included in one of his publications of the activity. And this is his drawing of the French conquest of Algeria which imaginally de depicts the barbarous but manly Arab warriors who are found on horseback being greeted by the trappings of Roman civilization. 
And you can see here, it's not that the French invaded with a bunch of women. Um, these are the muses. They are bringing the civilization of, uh, of Roman civilization back to Algeria, the gift of the French uh, to the Algerians. By integrating the history of archeology span with the realities of the violence of this military conquest and pacification of Algeria, we thus gain valuable insight not only into the values, priorities, and preoccupations of French colonial occupation of Algeria, but also into the origins of the classical study of the Roman past. Thank you. Thank you again for this, uh, I will say, how do you say? Enlightening. <laughs> I choose always the worst words <laughs> to, to talk. And I think mostly for those who are not used to this kind of subjects, this must have been fundamental to understand also that we have to understand the past, and it's very classical. I used to say this is not true, understanding the past to interpret the present, but in our days this subject becomes again and again important in the days in which archaeology, unfortunately, it's coming again in the news because of war, because of what people is doing and manipulating our work, how our work is being manipulating uh, to justify or not a war or an intervention or what is going to happen. I'm sure there are lots of questions. I want to thank also, seeing that we are also online, our friends from uh, the history department. There are many students here uh, from uh, medieval history who wanted to join us today. So thank you for coming. And if any, and sorry, cinema and colonialism also is there at the end, Farah Polato. So nice uh, having you all here. Is there any question? I'm sure there are so many questions about this subject. Remember, not questions are unimportant. It can help us also to see what you understood or not. Any question? Can you speak very loud? So I, I would say, um, it, so the, my project, I'm only looking at the period before the Third Republic, because in 1871, it's made into a civilian province, and that's the point at which things really begin to change. By the 1880s, archaeology is, is much more institutionalized in this region. So the period I'm looking at is simply officers who go on their own, and a couple civilian missions, including that of Léon Renier to collect inscriptions. So I would say in this period, no. The only time the vandals are mentioned that I've found is when um, they talk about the destruction of Roman sites. They say that the Berbers are descended from the vandals, and that the vandals destroyed, that they created nothing. So the assumption is that there would be no vandal remains. The only sign of vandals is their destruction of Roman structures and they're associated with the end of the Roman Empire. So unfortunately, no. Um, in the 18, um, uh, there's a, uh, one, the one exception really on the Byzantine period, if you want to consider that, I guess, post-Roman, I don't know, but uh, you know, following the Byzantine conquest of the vandals, um, there's work done by the, uh, uh, I guess you could call them archaeologists, art historian, historian, it's sort of a mix of all of them, is, is Charles Deal, who publishes in the 18, I think in 1883, the first book to be written on Byzantine remains in North Africa. But really because I think uh, of officers' interests and their activities, that this is really um, not on the table. Um, if And I'm, I'm also interested in the, the Christian archaeology of North Africa. 
And really, for the most part, it's not acknowledged. Sometimes we know that there were basilicas located very close to where these French officers were operating, and they simply don't mention them, or they mention them in passing. Um, there, there are one or two attempts to, to do a little bit of excavation uh, in the 1850s at sites like Tibessa, but uh, for the most part, no. Um, uh, Christian archaeology really starts in North Africa after the creation of um, the, um, the, the arrival of the White Fathers. So the, um, the Archbishop uh, of Algiers, a man named uh, Charles La Vigueri, uh, or La Vigerie, excuse me, he begins, uh, he, he comes to Africa in the midst of the crisis uh, of 1868. And so he, um, he is very interested in missionary work, and in that sense, the late antique past is very important because, of course, this is seen as the home of St. Augustine, um, and this is very important to his discourse. And so he creates a missionary order, which would be known as the, the Père Blanc, the White Fathers, and they would do, um, in addition to their missionary work, they did archaeological work in North Africa starting in the 1880s. And, and the person in question here is, uh, the, the most dominant uh, figure in this movement is um, Alfred de Latre, uh, who excavated mites, and it was seen as part of the propagation of Christianity in North Africa. But the reason it doesn't happen until after 1870 is that when it was a military province of the French, it was a, colony, a military colony, um, they didn't want religion to play a very important role in the conquest because they were afraid of the implications this would have for the indigenous people, and they tried to play down the idea of both missionary work and Christian excavations. So that's why it's pretty late. Um, I'm thinking about returning to Père de Latre for a future project, because his work is really interesting, and I'm interested in the way that it's, it's linked into the missionary process that, that happens in North Africa. But yeah, unfortunately, I, I was expecting that, that Vandal things would be sort of more on the table, but it's mainly used by the French as an insult by saying, um, you know, when they get to Lambasis, for instance, they say, oh, it's so interesting, like the, the Berber people in this area, some of them have blue eyes, some of them have light colored hair. Um, this must be the result of the Vandals. These are people who are descended from the Vandals, and so it, 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 by implication, it links them to the destruction of the site rather than playing a useful purpose at, at Roman sites, so. Thank you. Uh, have you some information about local uh, reaction of the destruction and French studies and of things? No, local reaction. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really know. Um, what, what is clear is that, that indigenous people were very familiar with these sites. We know from local mosques that they used spolia just as the French, you know, we can see in medieval France that there were items from Roman sites that were incorporated into mosques. And if we look at um, 12th, 13th, 14th century Arab historians, they're clearly familiar with the Roman presence in North Africa. They describe the aqueducts. They talk about Roman military engineering as being very important to the region. Unfortunately, what we don't know in the 19th century is what local reaction is. And I've spent a lot of time trying to locate sources that might suggest awareness of this. At this point, all I can say is that through the eyes of the French officers who were doing the earliest work in the 1830s. They consulted with locals. Um, I found the work of a general named Duvivier, and Duvivier uh, couldn't go, it, for instance, he couldn't go to Lambasis. And he, so he, he was uh, based in, um, in Guelma, which was ancient Kalama. And he wanted to know what was further afield where he couldn't go safely without a military escort and he didn't have the time to do it because of his responsibilities in the army. And he says that when, and he spoke some Arabic, so when local people would come, he would ask them about where antiquities were located. So I think the, it's clear that the indigenous people had a meaningful relationship with these sites, knew where they were, in some cases, it's possible that there were sort of superstitious stories that were attached to this, but because in, uh, I, I'm very interested in Lambasis, for instance, in this case, we don't know how much of the population was actually literate. 
And so except through the words of uh, these contemporaries, I haven't been able to find um, sort of uh, independent writings that were done by Arab historians and the Arab historian, because unfortunately I don't have Arabic, the Arab historians though with whom I've consulted seem to be completely unaware of there being sort of a textual record from this late period. And that's why I've gone back to like 14th century sources to show that there was a tradition in Arabic of understanding these places. But in terms of reaction against the destruction of these sites, I, I, my reaction would simply be that this was the least of their worries, that these were people who were losing their homes. Um, we know from the 1890s, for instance, in uh, Tunisia, and this is work that's been done by Clementine Goutron, that there were people living on the site, for instance, of Duga, and they were kicked off the site by the French uh, archaeologists, uh, in this case, a man named Carton. He said, you must leave. I mean, they were living on the site. He cleared the site. So in those cases, yeah, the reaction must have been very negative. But the amount of destruction in Tunisia is considerably less than in Algeria. But I think that the French so radically transformed the landscape of Algeria that, that essentially there was this, this history was cut. And, and I think that the French so convincingly made an argument that these are our monuments, not yours, that now in Algerian discourse, if I understand correctly, that these are not seen as part of their, uh, an integral part of the patrimony, except by people who specialize in this. That in places like Algeria and Tunis, uh, Roman sites are mainly seen as sites that are in visited by tourists, and they're for tourists, but that they don't have uh, local importance anymore. But I would argue that before 1830, it was different. It's just that a, a memory of that has been lost because of the effectiveness of the, Ro the French campaign in suggesting the Roman ancestors were all exclusively of Europeans and not of locals. So I don't know if that, that answers your question, but unfortunately, this has, been, this has been a huge challenge of this project because I wanted to try to also include the indigenous voice. But unfortunately, I almost exclusively include it via French officers' reports of having spoken to locals, but I, I don't have any accounts by locals speaking in their own words, so. Sure, sure, sure. So, I mean, in linking, in linking this to that bigger question, um, I think one of the, I, I think there are phases that occur in which this, this narrative shifts depending upon the political circumstances in France. So, I mean, my last project looked at the local archaeologists and the way that they excavated. And, and I argue, in fact, that their argument was largely ignored because as industrialization took place in France and they found all of these cemeteries, which uh, on the basis, whether you agree with the argument or not, but on the basis of weapons, they believed that these cemeteries were Frankish, okay? So, but, but because the archeological societies were outside of academia and the historians who were writing historical narratives of this period were in universities, first of all, there was a significant uh, clash between professional historians and amateur archaeologists, which meant to a large extent that the historians were able to, to discount the work that was being done by archaeologists in the antiquarian societies as amateurs. And in essence, wherever they encountered this, they either ignored what the archaeological societies were doing so that they could continue their narratives of the clash between Franks uh, and Romans and the descent of, uh, of the French from the Gallo-Romans. Um, so they downplayed the results that were being turned up by archeologists. Um, but, and, and this is particularly true under Napoleon III, uh, who of course was interested in, in the Gallo-Roman past and the Roman past to the exclusion of virtually everything else. But what happens is 1870 and the German uh, war, right? And the invasion and the annexation of Alsace-Lorraine 
And I would argue at that point that suddenly this past becomes very important because the Germans, who have been assiduously reading French publications of Frankish cemeteries put out by the archaeological societies, people like uh, Lindenschmidt, for instance, are very familiar with this past. And they use it to claim Alsace-Lorraine since time immemorial as Germanic. And thus, it, I wouldn't say it's the reason they invade, but it's a very useful discourse to have at hand. And the early work of the archaeological societies in, uh, in annexed Alsace-Lorraine, which are directed by the Germans, the first thing they do is start to make maps. And they plot all of the Frankish cemeteries that have been identified by French, um, by French antiquarians. And they make their own maps, which show the extent to which the Franks had taken over uh, Gaul. And this uh, reappears during World War I. And it certainly is being used by the Germans in the 1930s in the events that lead up to World War II. This, this heritage is absolutely important. And I would argue, though, that there's still attempts by the French as late as the 1930s to acknowledge this Gallo-Roman past. For instance, if you look in the, in the early 1940s, excuse me, at Vichy, Vichy does almost exclusively Gallo-Roman archaeology. So they, they don't want to contradict the Germans by uh, directly fighting with them over the results that they're finding and the way they're using Frankish archaeology in uh, occupied France. Instead, in, in, uh, the, under the Vichy government, they look at the Gallo-Roman past as a way of, of claiming a different past for themselves um, than the one that the Germans are trying to narrate. So this is a, a constant struggle, I would say. Whether, how, to what extent Algeria contributes to this conversation, and I think Algeria is a manifestation of it. When I started this project, I was going to try to show how much influence comes from Algeria into France as a result of this identification that you see taking place. But the, only, the main thing that I can show, the contribution of the Algerian archaeological experiment in France, is first of all the use of uh, soldiers to do excavations because this influences Napoleon III at Alésia. He doesn't use troops coming from Algeria, but he still, he uses a military structure and the digs at Alésia and Gergevi uh, uh, and a number of the other digs he does are all led by military men. And I can't help but think that in part is an importation from the way that the French did large scale out, uh, uh, archaeology, possibly, although they weren't doing such large-scale ar archaeology in North Africa, but on a number of instances I can show that they used 50, 100 soldiers at a time to do their digging. So, so I think this, this is the, the main legacy of that past. It's also an interest in the Roman past uh, in a way that, I mean, you could see in the south of France, but which Napoleon III tries to make more dominant, but ultimately it's not all that successful. Um, they wanted to open in the Louvre a wing that was going to be similar to the wing that's dedicated to Egyptian history. They wanted to open one that was going to be called the Musée Algérien. It was going to be a gallery inside of the Louvre. It never happens because the Louvre curator at the time, uh, Louis Courageaud, he said that the North African stuff was second rate, that they liked much better the materials they'd confiscated from Rome and <laughs> that they had from the south of France, that uh, the North African stuff was sort of second rate and he didn't want it in the Louvre. So there was a lot of ambivalence about this past. But it's clear, I, th it, they're related, but um, Algeria, I don't know if one could say it, it proves a lesson, because it's too much, I think, of an offshoot um, from the main story. But where it becomes very important is shaping classical history, which I think, classical history and archaeology, which I think in large part is so based, focused on the army, because of a result of the legacy that we see here. And the fact that, you know, sort of vandal uh, archaeology really is something that happens very, very late, um, not, not happening in this early period, um, basically 1950s and afterwards. Um, so, um, yeah, this unfortunately is, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I think we can close with this. Okay, Thanks I think, again. Yeah, my Thank pleasure. Thank you very much. I hope you're having a good time. Yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes.